Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll, we'll get started. Uh, I'm Scott Manellis, and I'm really delighted to welcome you here uh, to Max's thesis defense. Uh, Max holds the honor of being the first uh, person, the first student in my lab um, ever to defend virtually. And I think we're all hoping here that this will also be the last uh, one of this type. Um, I met Max about five years ago uh, when he accepted an offer from the graduate program in mechanical engineering here at MIT. Uh, and before coming to MIT, Max had completed his bachelor degree in mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. Uh, and as an undergraduate there, uh, Max already had an impressive track record in the lab. He had developed from ground up a very clever uh, microfluidic system for non-invasively measuring intracranial pressure. Um, and then he also carried out animal studies to, to validate uh, this approach that he developed. Uh, and so when Max wrote me about five years ago, he said he was interested in designing new tools to make biological measurements. Uh, and I could say that he's had a highly productive time uh, in my lab doing exactly that. What he will present to you today is a major project that took place in the latter half of his time in my lab. So I want to take just a quick minute or make a, a few quick remarks about what Max will not be talking about. So actually during the earlier part of his time in my lab, uh, Max directed a great deal of his effort towards developing a very novel approach for creating tumor organoids with single cell resolution. Uh, and together with uh, a co collaborator of ours at MGH, uh, Max played a primary role in writing uh, an R21 proposal to the NCI that was subsequently funded uh, and now constitutes an, an important area of ongoing work uh, in the lab uh, where Max is also actively involved. So all this is just to say that uh, Max has been incredibly productive uh, during his time in my lab, and he's successfully addressed a series of important uh, challenges uh, and problems associated with precision measurement. So with that, uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, for Max to be here today to share with you uh, what are some very exciting results uh, on a novel uh, measurement approach that he developed and then applied to a clinical study in brain cancer. So with that, I will hand it over to Max to take it from here. Thank you all for coming. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Scott, for uh, the introduction and thanks everyone else for uh, being here today for this. So for my talk today, uh, I'm gonna talk about, um, you know, as Scott said, one specific uh, problem or one specific research question that the lab has been interested in for a few years now. So the question that I'm gonna talk about today is this. So how do we match cancer patients to the most effective drugs or therapies that are available to them? And so just to set the stage a little bit for this question, uh, this is a situation that comes up all the time uh, in clinical oncology in different forms. And so it's very common for doctors to have a patient with cancer, uh, to have several options of drugs that they could give that patient, and to need to make a decision of, okay, given what I know about this patient, uh, what drug is likely to work best, or what drug should I give this patient? And so we are interested specifically in developing tools to help uh, make better decisions in those situations. And so uh, before we get too far, I wanted to take a second to thank uh, and acknowledge uh, a couple of specific people uh, from our lab and collaborators who I've gotten to work with uh, very closely on this project. So uh, from our lab, I wanted to highlight uh, specifically uh, Jennifer and Manor. And so Jennifer and Manor are both uh, very talented research technicians. And so, uh, you know, I've worked very close with them and they've, they've collected a lot of the data that we will look at today. Uh, there's others from our lab that I've gotten to work with, including Vincent, Salim, Rob, uh, and Chris, or previously in our lab, uh, and they've all worked on different aspects of either uh, designing or fabricating or testing uh, the microfluidic devices that I'll talk about today. And then we also have our clinical collaborators, and I wanted to highlight especially uh, Keith Ligon and from his lab, uh, Seth and Jack. And so we worked very closely with Keith's lab on uh, this clinical study that I'll talk about today. Uh, as well as with our other collaborators from DFCI that I've highlighted here. So this really has been a, a group effort between our lab and many others. So back to this question then of how do we match cancer patients to the best available treatment? So you may be familiar with this term, uh, precision cancer medicine, which refers to the idea of studying every individual patient's tumor uh, to try to match them to the most effective therapy that's available. And so usually when people use this term, uh, precision cancer medicine, they're referring specifically to genomic profiling, meaning looking for mutations in a patient's tumor uh, that tell us what drugs are likely to respond to or not respond to. 
And so this approach of genomic profiling has been really successful uh, for certain groups of patients and in certain cancers. But the reality is that right now, only a relatively small fraction of cancer patients can be matched to uh, the quote genome guided drugs. So the estimate is that if you undergo genetic testing across all cancers, there's only about a 15 to 20% chance uh, that you can be matched to a drug based on a mutation found in your tumor. And so that's a relatively small number. And, uh, you know, if you look at the slope of this line on the right, it's not increasing very quickly either. So, you know, since 2006, it's only gone up a couple of percentage points. And so for that reason, uh, we're interested in coming up with new uh, complementary techniques for matching patients to the most effective treatments. And so one idea that's been around for a while is what we call the functional drug susceptibility test. And the analogy that we like to talk about here is with antimicrobial susceptibility testing. And so if you haven't seen this before, uh, this is a picture of the assay that would be done to decide which antibiotic to give you if you were ever in the hospital with a bacterial infection. So what they would do to run this assay is to take a culture of bacteria, uh, they would grow them up on uh, a dish like this, this circle we're looking at here to get plenty of cells to test. Uh, they would expose the cells to different antibiotics. Here they're loaded into these uh, white porous discs. Uh, the drugs diffuse out and it kills the bacteria. And so you can see then even by eye, which drugs do a better job or worse job of killing these cells. And so you can see specifically, you know, for example, all the ones on the left have diffused out and killed a larger number of cells while uh, the two in the top right haven't killed any bacteria. And so uh, this approach is really appealing for picking out effective treatments because we don't need to understand anything about the bacteria to do this test. So we don't need to know uh, what strain they are, anything about why they respond the way they do. We can just do this assay and pick out an effective choice of drug to give the patient. And so because this approach has been so successful in the infectious disease space and in the antimicrobial space, our idea and the idea that others have proposed is, well, why don't we do something similar to that in cancer? Or can we use functional drug susceptibility testing to pick out effective drugs for cancer patients? So the analog of this approach in cancer would look something like this. So we could take a tumor biopsy from a patient. Uh, we can break the tumor down to single cells and isolate the tumor cells if we need to. We could expose those cells to different candidate drugs, so drugs we might consider treating the patient with, and then we can measure how the cells respond to those drugs using different functional assays. Uh, so in here, a functional assay just means any uh, cellular phenotype that we can measure to determine whether the cells are responding to the drug or not. So this could be uh, things like cell viability, proliferation, um, cell growth, apoptosis, metabolism, uh, we're just looking for anything that can change in response to drug exposure uh, to tell us whether the cells are responding or not. And the ultimate goal then will be that we would use the results of those functional assays to make treatment recommendations. And so uh, it would allow us to say, for example, that for this specific patient, uh, drug B appears to be a good choice for killing their tumor cells while drugs A and C maybe don't. And again, just like the uh, anti-microbial uh, example, this approach is really appealing because we don't need to understand why the tumor cells respond the way they do, right? We don't need to understand why this tumor responds to drug B, but not A or C. Uh, this test could just allow us to pick out that that would be a good choice to treat this patient. And so while this idea has been around for a long time and it has obvious appeal, there are still no functional assays actually used in the clinic. And so there are no situations in clinical oncology where that approach that I just showed you of performing drug testing to determine how to treat cancer patients, where that's actually done. And so here I pulled just this clinical practice guideline just to emphasize this point that at the time that they wrote this review, uh, there were no chemosensitivity and resistance assays, uh, which is their name for functional assays, uh, where there is sufficient evidence to support use in oncology practice. And so while there's a lot of anecdotal evidence in different cancers or for different uh, subsets of patients, uh, none of that work has yet been convincing enough and practical enough uh, to actually be used in the clinic. And so every cancer is different and every cancer has its own unique reasons why these measurements have been hard to make. Uh, but these are some of the recurring challenges that we see over and over again with this work. One of the primary challenges with this and anything involving primary patient material is that you only have a limited number of tumor cells typically to work with. 
And so, of course, this depends on the cancer, but a normal solid tumor biopsy might contain tens of thousands of cells, and that sets an upper bound on how many different drugs you can test, for example, how many drug doses you can test, and that kind of thing. The second challenge I've highlighted here is that tumor cells don't typically proliferate uh, or divide uh, outside the body. Um, and so, of course, again, this depends on the cancer, but so not only do you start with a small number of tumor cells, in many cases, you can't grow more, like you could in the bacteria example. And then finally, a third challenge is that tumor cells in many cases will only remain viable for a limited period of time after they're removed from the body. And so this can make it hard to set up these experiments because we're trying to kill tumor cells with a drug, but they're on their way to dying anyway. And so you just have to be very careful about setting up your uh, experiment and setting up your controls in an appropriate way uh, to make sure that you're not getting misleading results here. And as I said, every cancer is different. Uh, every cancer has its own unique challenges, but these are some of the ones that we see over and over again in this field. But we're still interested in this vision of doing functional drug susceptibility testing in cancer. And our lab has chosen to focus specifically on this, improving this part of the workflow. Uh, we want to come up with better functional assays for measuring how cells respond to drugs. And so no matter how we collect the tumor biopsy, no matter how we isolate the tumor cells, no matter how we drug the cells, we want to come up with better measurements for measuring how those cells respond to drugs as a readout for functional testing. And so our lab's main uh, contribution in this space is a sensor that we built for measuring the mass of single cells. And uh, this is a picture of the sensor and we call it a suspended microchannel resonator or SMR. And so just to get you oriented here, uh, what we are looking at is a tiny uh, silicon microfabricated cantilever beam, so this diving board structure. Uh, so this beam is around 300 microns long. <coughs> it's around 50 microns wide, depending on the device. And uh, as I've drawn here, we're vibrating it up and down at its resonance frequency, which is around one megahertz. So when we want to measure the mass of a cell with this device, here's what we do. We take the cell, flow it through the cantilever out to the tip and back uh, through this fluidic channel running through it. And so as we do that, the mass of the particle causes a reduction in the resonance frequency of the cantilever. And so, uh, as you know, uh, just like when you jump on a diving board, when you add mass to a cantilever, you reduce its resonance frequency. So we can flow a cell through, measure the signal, and the amplitude of that signal tells us the particle's mass, right? The bigger the particle, the bigger the reduction in resonance frequency that we measure. So just to summarize, this is a device we can make in the lab. We can flow a suspension of cells one after another through the structure and measure the mass of each one as they flow by. So here's just a little bit more detail on how this measurement works and why the signal looks the way it does. So if we were to look at this cantilever beam from the side, we would see something like this. Uh, uh, so we're vibrating the beam at uh, the frequency corresponding to its second bending mode. So along the length of the beam, it has this profile where it goes up and then comes back down. So when a particle that we want to weigh uh, enters the cantilever, it gets about halfway down and it reaches this first uh, special position that we call the antinode. And this antinode position is special because there is, uh, as you can see in the picture on the top right, there's a local maximum in the deflection of the beam. And so intuitively, because the particle is moving a lot, when it's at that point, its mass causes a bigger reduction in resonance frequency. And so that's why we have this peak in the signal. When the particle flows a little bit further, uh, it reaches this next special position that we call the node. Uh, and the node position is special because that point never moves. So as the cantilever oscillates, this node position always stays in the same place. And that's why we get no reduction in resonance frequency. Finally, the, the particle flows all the way out to the tip where it turns around. And again, because there's a large vibration amplitude at that point, there's a large reduction in resonance frequency. And so all of this um, you know, can just be summarized that these are devices we can fabricate um, in our lab. Uh, we can flow cells, uh, a suspension of cells through the structure and measure the mass of each one as they go by. And so you'll notice down in the bottom left, this paper that I've cited, which was one of the first SMR papers from the lab, uh, was from back in 2007. And so we've had these devices around in the lab for a while now, and we've continued to try to improve on them. So to make them uh, smaller, to make them faster, to make them more sensitive, uh, and just generally to use them in new interesting ways for different applications. One application that we've really been exploring over the past couple of years is using these devices to measure the growth uh, of single cells. 
And so this is a picture of a device that we use to measure the growth rate of a single cell. And so again, in this picture, uh, we're looking at a silicon microfabricated structure, but as you can see, this one has 10 SMRs, uh, 10 cantilever beams side by side on the same device. So when we want to measure the growth rate of a single cell, here's what we do. So starting from, from the left, we will take the cell that we want away, flow it through this first sensor and measure its mass. The cell will then flow through one of these long delay channels that you can see at the top of the picture, and it takes about two minutes before it reaches the next sensor where it gets weighed again. It goes through another delay channel, and about two minutes later, it gets weighed again and again and again. And so in total, we weigh the same cell. We measure its mass a total of 10 times over a period of 15 or 20 minutes. And so during the time that a cell flows through this device, it's still growing. And so for this uh, example cell on the right, uh, this specific cell got about half a picogram larger as it flowed from the first sensor to the 10th. And so the slope of this line is a measure of that cell's instantaneous growth rate. And so we call the slope of that line mass, that cell's mass accumulation rate, or MAR, M-A-R. So just like the last devices I showed you, uh, we can take a suspension of cells, uh, flow them one after another through this array of sensors and measure not just the mass, but the growth rate of every cell as it flows by. So what does this have to do with drug susceptibility testing? Well, what we found is that MAR, this instantaneous single cell growth rate, uh, is actually a good readout for functional drug susceptibility testing measurements. And so uh, what we found is that in many cancers, when you remove a tumor cell from the body, in many cases, it will still continue to grow for a while, even if it never goes through a division. So this, this trace on the left labeled vehicle control uh, represents uh, a typical tumor cell that's growing outside the body as it flows through this device and it has a positive mass accumulation rate, a positive slope, and it's getting bigger. But what we found, importantly, is that for many different types of anti-cancer drugs, so cytotoxic drugs, uh, cytostatic drugs, different types of targeted therapies, when you expose tumor cells to those drugs, in many cases, uh, cells to the tumor cells' growth rates, or MAR, will go from positive, like on the left, to zero or slightly negative, like on the right. And so we can use this shift in MAR from positive to negative or zero uh, to infer that this particular tumor cell is responding to the drug that we expose it to. If the tumor cell just kept growing after drug exposure, we might start to wonder, and you know, with more evidence, we might, do, we might conclude that the tumor cell has some sort of resistance mechanism to that drug. And so we think that this MAR assay has a couple of important advantages over other ways that you can measure drug response. So obviously, there's very simple ways that you could measure the response of a cell to a drug, right? You can use a microscope. You can look at changes in cell number. Um, you can use viability markers based on DNA. Uh, but one of the important advantages that we think about for this assay is that it works for non-proliferating cells, meaning even if the tumor cells are not actively progressing through the cell cycle, uh, which is the case in many cancers, uh, we're, we're just using an instantaneous mass accumulation right here, and so we can still do our measurements. And so there's been a lot of work from the lab over the last couple of years showing that this assay is predictive, meaning it predicts some aspect of patient response, uh, in different cancers, in leukemia, and especially in multiple myeloma. So I'll give you a specific example of what this data looks like. And so in this example, uh, we are measuring the response of a leukemia cell line called BAF3 BCR able to a drug called imatinib, which is a BCR able inhibitor. And so on this plot, uh, we're, we're showing MAR versus mass. So each dot here is one single cell. The Y coordinate is that cell's growth rate, and the X coordinate is that cell's mass. And so as you can see here, before drug exposure, all the cells are still growing, right? They all have mass accumulation rates of around maybe four to eight picograms per hour. So they're all growing as they flow through this device. But as we might expect, when those cells were exposed to imatinib, a drug that we know them to be sensitive to, uh, their MAR very quickly goes from positive to close to zero for most cells. And so we could use this reduction in MAR from positive to close to zero to infer that the cell line is sensitive to this drug, even though we already knew that in this case. As another example, we considered another cell line uh, called BAF3 BCR able t 305 i which is very similar to the other cell line, but uh, it has a mutation that causes it to be resistant to be a MAP or it, it causes it to be resistant to imatinib. So we, we would not expect these cells to be responsive to imatinib, and uh, consistent with that, we don't see any reduction in MAR with imatinib exposure. 
And so just to reiterate here, we already knew the correct answer for both of these samples, right? We already knew that we expect the left cell line to respond to a matinib and the right one not to respond to a matinib. Uh, but this experiment was one of the early pieces of evidence that helped convince the lab that we could use this mass accumulation rate biomarker for doing drug susceptibility testing. And so there's one very important limitation of the MAR assay that I want to talk about. And there's one very important reason why the assay hasn't made faster progress uh, toward clinical adoption than it has already. And the limitation is that the measurement is very slow to make. And so, of course, this depends on the sample and the drug, but for a typical sample, we estimate that it takes about an hour to measure MAR for enough cells to resolve this reduction in MAR that we see on the left. And so for one or two or a small number of samples, uh, one hour per sample might be okay, right? But um, in the clinical setting where you might want to test many drugs per patient, uh, you might want to do multiple drug doses, you might want to do multiple technical or biological replicates, uh, that one hour per sample really quickly starts to add up. And it can be a problem when you only have several hours, um, a window of several hours uh, to work with your sample before the cells start dying. And so this has been a really important uh, limitation uh, in moving the MAR assay forward toward actual clinical adoption. And so because of this, we started to think uh, about whether there are other ways we could use our devices for doing drug sensitivity testing. <clears throat> and we, so we started to think about, is there something else we can measure to uh, detect this drug response without having to measure the growth rate of every individual cell, which is technically hard. So our idea was, well, instead of measuring the shift in MAR, can we measure the shift in cell mass to detect the drug response? And so obviously, we, this is a much less sensitive measurement. There's a much smaller reduction in cell mass than there is a reduction in growth rate. But if we weighed enough cells, we could potentially resolve this. And the reason we would do this is that it could be a much higher throughput measurement. And specifically, we estimate that we could weigh enough cells to measure this or resolve this reduction in mass in about two minutes per sample uh, compared to the one hour per sample required uh, using the MAR assay. And so uh, this is what I'm going to talk about today. We, we spent some time exploring whether this approach could be a, a viable alternative to MAR for doing drug sensitivity testing using SMRs. And so to convince ourselves that this approach was feasible, we came up with this toy example where we're imagining this, this simulated tumor sample. And so these aren't real numbers, but we're just saying, okay, imagine we have 100 tumor cells. They have a certain distribution of masses, a certain distribution of growth rates. Uh, and then we treat those cells with a drug that's going to reduce their growth. So we asked, what will we measure if we ran the MAR assay on the sample? What will we see if we measure the growth rate of these cells before and after drug exposure? Well, we would see something like this. We would measure the growth rates of the, the cells before um, drug exposure labeled control and find that they have a higher growth rate. We would measure the growth rates of the cells after drug exposure and find that they have a lower growth rate. And we could uh, be very highly statistically confident looking at this data that the drug is reducing cell growth. So we asked next, well, so that's what we would have done before. What would we see if we ran the mass assay on this sample instead? So if, instead of measuring the growth of every individual cell, what would we see if we just measured the mass distributions of the cells before and after drug exposure? And this is what we would see. So there is a small reduction in cell mass in response to drug exposure, but as you can see, it's much smaller than the reduction in MAR. And with only 100 cells, it turns out that we, uh, would not be able to resolve with the level of statistical confidence that we would want uh, that this drug is significantly reducing cell growth or mass. And so for this specific simulated tumor sample, the MAR assay would be a better choice for reading out the drug response doing due to its higher sensitivity. But next we thought, okay, well, so what if we could weigh a thousand cells rather than a hundred? And so a thousand cells is reasonable. That's comparable to what many other functional assays will require for drug condition that they test. So what would these two uh, ex experimental data simulations look like at the bottom if we weighed a thousand cells rather than a hundred? So well with MARC, we were very highly statistically confident of the reduction in MARC with only a hundred cells and weighing a thousand in cells. A thousand instead doesn't really help. But uh, by cell mass, if we could weigh 1,000 cells rather than 100, then we could be very confident in resolving this small reduction in cell mass. And so we could use this assay to uh, infer that these cells are responsive to this specific drug. And again, the reason that we would do this is that this assay could potentially have much, much higher throughput 
And as I said before, it would take an hour to run this experiment by MAR, but only two minutes uh, to do the same experiment by just measuring mass. So again, about, about a factor of 30 faster. So just to summarize here, these are two different approaches uh, where we can use our devices to do drug sensitivity testing and to measure drug response. Uh, each of these two approaches has advantages and disadvantages. The MAR assay has the clear advantage of requiring fewer cells because it's just a much more sensitive measurement. Um, the MAR assay also has the advantage of giving us single cell resolution, so we could potentially detect individual drug sensitive or resistant cells in a mixed population with the MAR assay. With mass, we couldn't do that. But if we're willing to give up those two advantages, the mass assay has the advantage of having much, much higher throughput. And so, as I've said before, while it would only take uh, two minutes to measure this drug response by mass, it would take about an hour by mass. And so there's two parts of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so first, we spent some time doing the engineering. So we, we tried to make our cell mass measurements uh, as high throughput as we possibly could, because we wanted to take this measurement from a laboratory instrument to uh, a sort of you know, workhorse tool that we could use for collecting data at a clinical scale. And so I'll give some highlights from that work. And then I'll go into more detail on this clinical study we did that Scott mentioned, uh, actually doing drug susceptibility testing in glioblastoma in the specific brain cancer. So first, how do we make our cell mass measurements as high throughput as we possibly can? So the first technical advancement we made was inspired by this device that I showed you before. And so you'll remember uh, with these serial SMR arrays, uh, these are devices where we can measure the growth rate of single cells by flowing one cell sequentially through several sensors on the same device. Our idea here was, well, if we don't care about measuring the growth rate of every individual cell, instead of connecting these sensors on series, can we connect them in parallel uh, on the same device? And so with these devices, we have still many SMRs on the same microfluidic device, but here, uh, each sensor is measuring the mass of particles at the same time, rather than one cell flowing through all of them sequentially. And so this is what this device actually looks like. Uh, on this particular device, uh, we have 16 uh, SMRs connected fluidically in parallel. And uh, you know, as I highlighted at the bottom, this particular device was designed by uh, Rob Kimmerling, who was formerly uh, a student in our lab. And so uh, to weigh particles, uh, as you can see here, we flow them in through this top horizontal channel, which we call the inlet channel. Uh, they go through the branches to be weighed in one of these sensors, and then they flow out the opposite side to waste through what we've labeled the outlet channel. We're able to operate all of these sensors at the same time on the same chip because we give them different resonance frequencies. And so if you look at this top picture, if you squint, you can see that the cantilevers have slightly different lengths, right? The outer cantilevers are a little bit shorter. Uh, the inner ones are a little bit longer. That gives them different resonance frequencies, and that allows us to, for example, uh, vibrate one cantilever at 700 kilohertz and another at 650 kilohertz uh, without one affecting the other one. And so uh, for anyone who's interested, you know, we can chat more about the details of how we set these devices up and the kind of testing we did, but this is an example of what the data looks like. And so in this example, uh, we were weighing a sample of seven micron polystyrene beads. And so we, you can just buy these, we use these for calibration all the time. And so this is a 60 second sample of the resonance frequency of, in this case, 10 cantilevers on this device. And so each blip in each one of these signals corresponds to one particle flowing through one of these sensors. And so these devices uh, were a very important step in allowing us to scale up to the point where we could uh, collect data at, at very high throughput. So another uh, initiative that has been going on in the lab for a few years now has been trying to scale up by making these devices easier to use. And so this is a picture that I like to show of um, an SMR system that we have in the lab. You know, many people have worked with it at one point. And so the thing to notice here is that while the uh, sensor itself uh, is just a tiny little piece of silicon, uh, it takes this whole optical breadboard full of stuff uh, to actually make the measurement. Right, so it takes the pneumatics, microfluidics to inject the samples, uh, some electronics to read out the cantilever deflections, uh, some more electronics for signal processing, a water bath. And so the, uh, as you can imagine, this was not really scalable. And we couldn't easily have uh, one person operating two or three or four of these systems at the same time uh, to collect data faster because every instrument, uh, in addition to being complex as I've shown you here, was just slightly different. 
And so a lot of the progress in this area was, was uh, catalyzed by Salim Okum previously, a postdoc in the lab who spent a lot of time thinking about how to take all these components and build these integrated systems. And so uh, here, all the, this, this box that you see on the right contains all the components that it takes to actually run one of these sensors. And so uh, it's, it's still just as technically complex, but a lot of the complexity is hidden from the person making the measurement. And this is much closer to a sort of plug and play instrument where we can put in a chip and start collecting data uh, than what we were at before. And so um, last year I got to work with a few other members of our lab setting up uh, this, this space, which we sometimes call an SMR core facility where uh, we, we have currently six of these systems uh, set up to make the different measurements that we can make, so mass, growth rate, stiffness, and our goal for setting up this space was just to reduce the uh, inertia or friction uh, as much as possible for collecting data. All right, so whenever we or anyone interested in collaborating wants to make a measurement, uh, you know, the goal is to be able to use the space and quickly do it without wor having to worry about, you know, what instrument we're going to use and that kind of thing. And so I show this just because most of the data that I'll show you today uh, was only really possible because of the space and was collected using one of these systems on the right here. So I showed you these parallel SMR array devices and using these devices, uh, you know, we calculate that we can get up to about 27 times higher throughput than we could before using our own devices. And so, as I said, this was a very important advancement in scaling up the throughput of our measurements. There's one other uh, technical advancement that I'm not going to talk about today, uh, which we call deconvolution. And so just the, the gist of it is that uh, one way you can scale up is by operating many SMRs on the same chip. Uh, but another way you can scale up is by flowing particles faster through each cantilever. And so it turns out when you do that, you run into um, a limitation of how fast you can resolve a shift in resonance frequency. And so we spent a long time thinking about how to get past that limitation. And uh, we uh, implemented this technique that we called de deconvolution because it's inspired by how people use deconvolution in microscopy. Uh, and so by doing this, uh, we were able to get another uh, 16 fold increase in how quickly we can measure particles using our devices. And we're hoping in the future with our next round of devices, uh, we'll design devices that will allow us to combine these two techniques and get, um, you know, our, our optimistic estimates are close to 200 fold uh, increase throughput compared to what we could do before. So now that I've given you some of the highlights on how we scaled up the throughput of our mass measurements, I'll talk uh, in a little bit more detail about this clinical study that we've done in glioblastoma. So uh, as many of you will be aware, uh, glioblastoma or GBM is very common and actually the most aggressive brain cancer that there is. And so even with treatment, uh, patients with GBM survive only a median of 15 months. And so it has one of the worst prognoses of any cancer. So if you are newly diagnosed with GBM, this is what you could expect your first couple months of treatment to look like. Uh, so starting from the top here, right away you would have surgery to remove as much of your tumor as possible. And then after this short surgery recovery period, you would start on chemotherapy and radiation. And so GBM is unique compared to many other cancers because there are no targeted therapies that are actually routinely used in the clinic. And so almost all patients uh, with GBM end up receiving the same chemotherapy regimen, this drug called temozolomide or TMZ. The problem is that about half of patients don't have any detectable response to TMZ, to the drug. And so you can tell this based on some imaging studies. If you look at the size of the patient's tumor before and after they get the drug, uh, the estimate is that for about half of patients, there's no detectable benefit. And so obviously this is a problem because you're, you're treating these patients with this, this incredibly toxic chemotherapy that is not even providing any benefit for their cancer. And so it would be great to be able to predict ahead of time who these TMZ resistant patients are going to be uh, before you give them the drug instead of finding out afterwards that they didn't benefit. So the question is, how do we predict whether a patient's going to respond to TMZ? So it turns out that there is a genetic or um, epigenetic actually biomarker for predicting TMZ sensitivity called MGMT promoter methylation. And so this is a test that can be done on your tumor. So you'll have surgery, they'll remove the tumor and they'll uh, send off uh, a piece of the tumor to have this test done. And so there's one of two results of this test. You can either be methylated or you can be unmethylated. If you are methylated, that is the good biomarker result to have. That means that you are likely to respond to TMZ. 
so this, this cartoon is just a picture of how this works. So if you have methylated MGMT, everything works as it should. Uh, so TMZ, the drug, enters the tumor cell. It causes this, this specific type of DNA damage, which is what it's supposed to do. That's how the drug works. Uh, that breaks the DNA strand and kills the tumor cells. So again, methylated MGMT, everything works as it should. But if you have unmethylated MGMT, you are unlikely to respond to TMZ. The reason for this is again shown in this picture. So uh, if you have unmethylated MGMT, TMZ enters the tumor cells. It attempts to cause this DNA damage, but uh, that damage is repaired by this molecule called MGMT. And so that allows the tumor cells to escape and survive, and these uh, patients typically respond poorly to therapy. So our idea in this project was, can we predict whether patients will respond to TMZ, but instead of using this MGMT promoter methylation biomarker, could we do it using functional drug susceptibility testing? So uh, we set up this study working with uh, Keith Ligon's lab at DFCI, uh, as well as the Center for Patient Drive Models at DFCI. And so the CPDM is a group that, that takes tumor tissue uh, collected at DFCI uh, and biopsies and establishes different types of patient-derived models, so xenografts and cell lines uh, specifically. And so they, they have these bagged and we can access these and use them as a surrogate for the patient's original tumor. And importantly, uh, the Ligon Lab and CP CPDM do a lot of the work of uh, matching these samples up with the clinical annotation so we can uh, access a, a tumor sample, a patient-derived model, uh, perform our functional testing on it, and then go back and look at how that patient actually responded to therapy. For GBM specifically, uh, the CPDM's resources uh, are this, this collection of about 140 of these what are called patient-derived neurosphere models. And so this is a way that you can take GBM tumor tissue and propagate the tumor cells in vitro. And so with the right a mixture of growth factors and nutrients, uh, the tumor cells form these uh, what are called neurospheres, so chunks of, of brain tumor tissue, uh, a couple hundred microns in diameter that will grow and proliferate um, in vitro. So here's how we set up this study for evaluating functional drug susceptibility testing in GBM. So as I mentioned, the Ligon Lab and the CPDM receive tumor resections from patients who have surgery at DFCI. Uh, they use them to establish these patient-derived neurosphere models. Uh, we bring those models back to MIT and expose them to drugs, either temozolomide or a control. And then at different time points, we measure how the tumor cells are responding to those drugs. And so we're measuring not only how the cells respond on the SMR, we're not just measuring the mass distributions, but we're also using these two other commercially available assays, uh, the Incucyte assay and the cell titer glow assay. And so I won't go into a lot of detail, but just briefly, uh, the Incucyte assay measures drug response by imaging uh, the neurospheres uh, using a microscope uh, before and after drug exposure. So we're looking at whether the cells get bigger or smaller when they're exposed to drugs. The cell titer glow assay is a very common uh, commercially available assay that just measures ATP levels as a proxy for the number of viable cells in the sample. So just zooming out, we're taking these models, exposing them to drugs, measuring how the cells respond to the drugs, and our ultimate goal is to see whether that functional drug susceptibility testing predicts how the patients actually responded to therapy. And so as we started collecting this data, uh, we noticed right away that patients fell into one of two categories, what we are calling here TMZ responders and TMZ non-responders. Here is an example of the SMR data from a patient that we classified as a TMZ responder. So BT440 is this patient's designation, and this is a plot of the mass distributions of uh, their patient-derived model uh, out to two weeks of drug exposure. And so the thing to notice here is that at day three, we don't see any response to the drug. But at day five and seven and out to 14, uh, you'll notice that the, uh, the drug-exposed cells in blue have started to actually get bigger. And so because there is a response here, uh, we call this a TMZ responder. And so incidentally, uh, it's, we're not surprised to see that the drug exposed cells are getting larger uh, because we think that the drug is arresting cells late in the cell cycle. So that's consistent with what we might guess given what we know about the drug. And so again, because we saw a response here, we call this a TMZ responder. On the other hand, for about half of the samples we measured, we don't see any detectable shift in the cell mass distributions at any time point of drug exposure. And so we will call BT330 and uh, the, the other models like it a TMD non-responder because we don't see any response. 
And so our hypothesis here that we were going to have to prove uh, was that, well, maybe this responder versus non-responder phenotype uh, or classification tells us something about the patient. And you might uh, expect that patients who are TMB responders uh, might be more likely to respond to therapy and perhaps survive for longer on therapy. But in order to prove this, we needed to measure a lot of samples. And so we spent about a year uh, measuring 80 of these uh, GBM patient-derived neurosphere models. And so each of these traces is just the data that I just showed you, but just from one of the patients that we measured. And so I've highlighted at the bottom uh, Jennifer uh, and Seth. So Jennifer from the Manalis lab, uh, Seth from Keith Ligon's lab. And they were involved with a lot of the day-to-day -day work of setting up these samples, drugging the cells, culturing the cells, running the SMR measurements and all that kind of stuff. So um, this was really could have been done in about four or five months of focus effort, but we, um, you know, we spent about a year setting up and, uh, you know, five finalizing this data set. And as I mentioned, we did not only the SMR assay, but also these incusite and cell titer glow assays to measure drug response. And so uh, at the conclusion of this, we had a really large, uh, interesting data set, and our, our goal was to sort through this and see whether all of this data could tell us anything about the patients that the tumor samples came from. So as a first step, um, you know, there's too much data on that previous slide to directly uh, sort of reason about, so we needed ways to summarize or aggregate all of that data into something more manageable. And as a first step, we wanted to define for each patient uh, one number that described how much of a TMZ responder that patient was. So, uh, for example, on the left, it's obvious by eye uh, that this patient is more TMZ responsive. It's obvious that the one on the right is less TMZ responsive, but we wanted to uh, quantify that with just a score of one number per patient. We considered a lot of ways that you could do that. For example, you could look at just the mean mass. The bigger the change in mean mass, the more TMZ responsive. But instead, we ended up using the score uh, called the Hallinger distance. And so this is just a statistic barb from machine learning. And all it is is a, a number that tells us how different two histograms are. So we can just take uh, one histogram P, the mass distribution of the control cells, the other histogram Q, uh, the mass distribution of the drug exposed cells, and calculate this number that tells us how different they are, uh, which, which measures how much of a TMZ responder that patient is. So for example, on the top right here, there was a very small difference between these histograms are very similar. There was not much of a drug response, and so this would be assigned a small Hellinger distance score. Uh, while on the bottom, uh, these histograms are more different. Um, there was more of a drug response, and so this patient would be assigned a larger Hellinger distance score. So uh, we calculated the score for every patient in our data set. And this is what it looked like. So the y-axis here, the coordinate is just the, the Hellinger distance score, the mean Hellinger distance for each patient. Each dot is one patient that we tested. And so the thing to notice here is that many of our patients have these scores clustered down uh, near zero. So all this, this cluster of patients down at the bottom of this plot had uh, a very small or no TMZ response um, across all of our time points of exposure. And for example, BT330 falls into that category, the one we looked at before. But for the rest of our patients, they have higher scores. Uh, so ranging from very responsive up at the top to somewhat less responsive further down below. And PT440 is around the middle of that spectrum. We did a similar analysis for the other two functional assays as well, the cell titer glow and acucyte assays. And so I won't go into detail about how we defined these cell titer glow response score and the incusite response score, but uh, the important thing is that just a higher score on any of these three assays means that you had a bigger TMZ response. So uh, it means that that assay output changed more in response to drug exposure. So we wondered now, well, we have the score for each patient describing how much of a functional TMZ responder there are. Does that tell us anything about the patient? And as a first step, uh, we compared this uh, to the MGMT biomarker. And so consistent with what we might expect, we found that patients with unmethylated MGMT, which is the, again, the bad biomarker to have means that you're unlikely to respond to the drug. Uh, we found that those patients had significantly lower functional response scores uh, than methylated patients. This was true not only for the SMR assay, but also for the cell titer glow and incusite assays. And so this was a useful first step uh, for convincing us that functional testing could tell us something real about the patients that the tumor samples came from. But at the end of the day, what we really want to do is predict survival. Uh, we, we want to take a patient sample, perform drug testing, and predict uh, how long they're likely to survive on therapy.
And so one way of doing that is to compare survival between the patients who are classified as SMR uh, or functional responders versus non-responders. And so in order to compare survival between those two groups, we first needed to classify patients as responders or non-responders. And so the simplest way to do that is just to draw a line in the data set and say, okay, I drew my line here at this decision boundary. Uh, if you have a higher score, all these patients in green, we're calling you a TMZ responder. If you have a lower score, all these patients in yellow, we're calling you a TMZ non-responder. So the obvious question is, well, where do we draw that line uh, to allow us to make the best predictions of survival? And so it turns out that there is a statistical tool for allowing you to decide where to draw that line. And so the tool is called the receiver operator characteristic. And so uh, the way to interpret this, this plot is that just depending where we draw this line, we'll get a certain true positive rate and a certain false positive rate or a certain sensitivity and specificity uh, for predicting how long patients will survive on therapy. So uh, I can talk more about the details for anyone interested, but uh, this analysis told us that where we've drawn this line here was a good uh, choice for classifying patients as TMZ responders versus non-responders. So we wanted to compare survival now between these two groups. We wanted to compare survival between the green patients and the yellow patients. And here's what that looks like. Uh, so if you haven't looked at these before, this is called a Kaplan-Meier plot, and we're looking at the fraction of patients that are surviving as a function of time uh, since their surgery. And so the way to interpret this is that if a curve uh, is further up and to the right, like the green curve here, the SMR responders, uh, that means that that group of patients survived for longer on therapy. And if a curve is further down and to the left, like the yellow curve, SMR non-responders, uh, that means that that group of patients did not survive for as long on therapy. So one way, uh, one conclusion that you could take away from looking at this plot is that SMR responders had significantly longer survival on therapy than SMR non-responders did. And there's other ways that you could summarize or aggregate this data. One way is looking at the median survival, and uh, you know we could compare the median survival between these two groups, and SMR responders had a median survival of 18.8 months uh, compared to only 11 months for SMR non-responders. And uh, so this would be a first step towards actually using this to make treatment decisions. And so uh, with some further evidence, you might start to think about uh, taking a patient sample, uh, doing functional testing, classifying them as, for example, a non-responder. And then you might say, okay, uh, because you are unlikely to survive for very long on therapy, uh, we might start to think uh, about putting you on a trial for another therapy that has at least some chance of providing some benefit for your disease. And so I have this, uh, this note in the corner that we focus for this analysis uh, on a subset of patients uh, meeting certain criteria to make sure that we're making fair comparisons here. Um, importantly, we've chosen to focus only on newly diagnosed as opposed to uh, combining newly diagnosed and recurrent GPM. And I can talk more about that. But uh, so we did the same analysis for the other two assays as well and did not find a statistically significant difference in survival between incusite and cell titer glow responders versus non-responders. And so, you know, I can speculate on why that is, but the, uh, the way to interpret these plots is that generally the bigger the gap between the two curves, the better or more predictive that biomarker is for predicting survival. And so you can see that uh, the incusite and cell titer glow assays, while they have some predictive power, there's, there's some uh, distance between those two curves intuitively, um, it ends up not being um, statistically significant and far less than the SMR assay. But the comparison that we really care about is uh, with MGMT, right? We know that this MGMT biomarker uh, has some ability to predict how long patients will survive on therapy. And we wanted to see how the SMR assay compared to that. And here's what that comparison looks like. And so uh, there's more detailed uh, comparisons that we can make, but uh, it is fair, I think, to say that uh, predictive power is similar for the SMR assay uh, and this MGMT biomarker. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's interesting that, so not only do we have a new way of predicting TMZ sensitivity, but uh, it's interesting that it's based on a totally different mechanism, right? MGMT is a molecular test. It's based on a methylation of one specific, uh, you know, site in, in um, the genome, while um, this SMR measurement is a biophysical measurement. We're measuring the mass of cells. 
And so there's more uh, analysis we can do here. We really explored, uh, you know, when did these two assays agree and disagree? Are there patterns in what patients they agree and disagree for? Uh, are there ways we can combine those two measurements to make even better predictions of survival? But uh, this is, uh, I just wanted to give sort of the flavor of the analysis that we've done for this study. And so just to summarize here, uh, this study was only possible because we were using this new high throughput cell mass measurement that has, again, about a 30-fold higher throughput than what we were doing previously. So this took about a year with this approach, and so it just would not have been possible at this scale uh, using the MAR assay that we were using before. Uh, the takeaway, again, from, from this GBM study is that uh, our predictive power for stratifying GBM patients by drug sensitivity uh, was comparable to MGMT, which is the current gold standard for making that prediction. And finally, uh, we've chosen in this study to focus on one specific clinical decision that needs to be made. So yes or no, should this patient be given TMZ? And so this is much less ambitious than a lot of other functional testing uh, approaches that are out there where people are testing uh, hundreds of drugs and kinase inhibitors and combinations, uh, trying to find the one magic combination for every individual patient. And so what we're hoping is that by trying to make this one specific decision very well, um, it, while this is less ambitious, we're hoping that will make faster progress toward actually being used in the clinic. And so um, I wanted to thank a couple more people in addition to who I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I wanted to thank uh, especially Scott Manalis. Um, so, you know, Scott has been a great advisor and, you know, I've learned a lot uh, over the past couple years working in the lab. Uh, I wanted to thank my, the members of my thesis committee. So professors Linda Griffith and Paul Blaney. Uh, we've always had a lot of really uh, great, uh, productive, interesting discussions about this project uh, as it's evolved. Uh, I wanted to thank, again, all of our collaborators, especially from DSGI, so Seth, uh, Jack uh, from Keith Ligon's lab, uh, Kinho from uh, CPDM, uh, as well as David uh, Weinstock, Mark Barkami, and Passiani, who we've worked on uh, other cancers with in addition to GBM. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, the, the team at Trevera, uh, which is a company that spun off with some similar uh, interests, but uh, it's been great to get to uh, interact with them and you know discuss with them both as this project has evolved and previously when they were in the lab. Uh, I wanted to thank some others at MIT, so especially uh, the 2309 team, so Julie, Steve, and Maxine, uh, you know, gave me the opportunity to TA for their class back in the fall, uh, and it was a great learning opportunity, and I had a great time doing it. And then I wanted to thank the Manalis Lab. So um, in addition to the people I already mentioned who worked with us, who I worked with specifically on this project, uh, you know, I'm not going to get to mention everyone, but um, you know, I just wanted to thank everyone for making it just such a great environment to work in. And then finally, I wanted to thank uh, my family and friends. So my family, uh, my mom, uh, my dad, uh, my sister Mackenzie, uh, my wife Amy, and everyone else uh, just for all of their support through the whole process of, um, you know, me being in grad school. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone for your time today, and I can take some questions now. Thanks.